here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is Matt Bartolini, head of Spider America's research at State Street Global Advisors. We're talking about the market outlook and uh, investing strategies for the second half of 2022. Matt, welcome back. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me back. So it's been a very challenging uh, market for investors. uh, And that's an understatement, I think. Both stocks and bonds have fallen at a pace which was not seen in decades. And uh, lately, we have seen some very volatile uh, moves, even in major indexes, up one day, down the next. But they have been mostly range-bound because investors are trying to figure out uh, where inflation is going to be in the coming months, uh, how many Fed rate hikes we will see, and whether we are going going to be in a recession or not. So let's start with your thoughts on the recent market action. Well, I mean, it's definitely been more volatile than we we're used to, which is kind of interesting given the fact that we've been in this environment of elevated volatility since the start of the pandemic. But what I think is interesting is when you look at it, it's 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 really sort of episodic. We, we haven't had uh, consistent volatility throughout, you know, obviously at the start of the pandemic, VIX went all the way up to 80 and it's significant volatility, but this has been sort of like range bound volatility. And what I think is interesting is that if you look at implied volatility levels using the VIX index, it's in the 90th percentile of the past three years. Similarly, you also have bond volatility, currency volatility, and oil volatility all above that 90th percentile over the past three years. So this idea of really cross-asset volatility uh, has been something that the market has had to endure. And now you're starting to add in some fundamental volatility because as you saw in the last earnings season, you're now having firms uh, being punished significantly that miss on earnings, but also you're seeing more downside revisions to earnings estimates. So there's basically for every upgrade, there's uh, an equal amount of downgrades right now for the S&P 500 stocks. And you know, about six months ago, that was about you know a, a 1.8 ratio. And every month since then, it's really fallen monotonically uh, month over month. So this idea of fundamental volatility is now creeped into the marketplace. And that, I think, as we saw during the earnings season, we had some really significant drawdowns and almost had the bear market. You know, that is something that the market was starting to really realize, start to factor into their longer-term forecasts. I think the really interesting thing, though, is when we look at realized volatility and we look at this, you know, what we are seeing on a day-to-day basis and having to, to witness is the fact that we have had a significant number of uh, plus or minus 1% moves in the S&P 500. In fact, you know, right now, there's, a, there's been about 53 of those moves in 2022. On average, you usually get about four a month. So in this year, it's about 10 a month. And there's actually been more to the downside. There's been about 57% of them have been to the downside. That's the highest amount of downside moves on the plus and minus 1% basis since the dot-com bubble. So this includes the pandemic. This includes the great financial crisis. It includes other other sort of systemic periods. So it's a really interesting time period for investors to try to express risk, but also how to structure portfolios because it's not just stocks that are down, it's bonds that are down. And you have conservative portfolios, that 2080 allocation down double digits. And that's something, you know, that would be, that is the worst drawdown ever experienced um, for that conservative portfolio. And I think that's just, it's, it's a very difficult time. I totally agree with you. It's a very difficult time. And one of the biggest concerns for investors is surging inflation. And uh, Lately, some experts have been st- uh, have started saying that uh, inflation has probably peaked, and there are some numbers which suggest that probably we have seen the peak in inflation, even though inflation would continue to remain at elevated levels. Uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Janet Yellen also said that in a Senate uh, testimony yesterday, uh, and that's mainly because uh, fact there are many factors which are beyond 
threats control, um, including the war and supply chain disruptions uh, resulting from the pandemic. And they are the main reasons uh, for uh, much of the rise in inflation. At the same time, it appears that economy is on a pretty solid footing and both consumer and corporate balance sheets, they remain strong so far. So do you think the Fed would be able to tame inflation without sending the US economy into a recession? I, I think so. I mean, a, a recession is definitely not our base case. You know, I think the Fed is going to essentially engineer a very somewhat of a soft landing. And part of the reason for that forecast is the Federal Reserve essentially has three tools to affect monetary policy. One is you know raising interest rates or cutting interest rates. Uh, the other is quantitative easing slash tightening. And then the other one is forward guidance. And I think this this Federal Reserve under Chair Powell has effectively used forward guidance for years to really prepare the marketplace for you know what is likely to come. And the forward guidance that we have had around inflation is that they're going to be ultimately very aggressive at the start. And they're going to have you know 50 basis point hikes you know subsequently subsequently over a few meetings. And that has really prepared the market. I think that's why we had this significant drawdown. So sort of the negativity has been priced in, it's been baked in a little bit. So I, that forward guidance has prepared the marketplace. I think what's going to happen is they'll be more aggressive at the front end and they'll start to ease as we start to see inflation start to fall. Um, so I think they will be able to enact sort of that soft landing and not cause an overall recession. I think also to that, though, is you know what you mentioned. We have a strong labor market. We have consumer balance sheets that have, you know, it's, it's definitely started to come down if you look at the excess saving rates. But uh, it's still well above uh, long-term averages. You have, you have corporation balance sheets that are still, uh, you know, what I would say is you know still strong. You know, there's there's definitely uh, a significant amount of cash uh, within those balance sheets, even though they've started to burn down a little bit. You know, but it's through buybacks, and you know, naturally you're going to see more buybacks in the declining market, uh, in just terms of you know buying back lower price shares of your own company. So I think there's some underpinnings of strong growth that is going to mitigate any harsh tightening cycle that the Fed is going to embark on. And that should likely prevent a sort of a recessionary period engineered by the Fed. So if we get a soft or softish landing, as the uh, Fed expects, uh, do you think the market uh, investors can expect a gradual recovery in the stock market in the second half? Uh, do you think a lot of bad news is already uh, priced in, in the first half performance where stocks uh, had a terrible performance? Uh, and you did talk about uh, these uh, downside earnings revisions. Uh, so putting all that together, what can investors expect from the second half? Well, I mean, honestly, I think they can probably expect a little bit more of the same because it's not just, you know, inflation that is driving market action. It is what will the Federal Reserve do as a result of inflation, but also what are some of the reasons why we have elevated inflation levels? And it is, you know, the Russia-Ukraine war. So what are the derivative impacts of that? You know, what is going to occur with that in and of itself? You know, if you all of a sudden have a ceasefire, and again, we're not saying that, but if, if you have a very clear-cut resolution on that, all of a sudden supply chains become a little bit more unlocked. You start to have, you know, less sort of supply-side inflation on different commodity markets. You know, so there's so many different path dependencies. I mean, you have a multidimensional amount of risks converging on one another that has really created this incursion within asset classes where you have stocks and bonds both down at the same time, but the but um, similarly, you have volatility levels also elevated. So it's not just about the Fed. It is not just about inflation. It is about some geopolitical risks. Not to mention, we will have a midterm election that is likely to be as tense as they all are usually. That could have an issue, that it could have an impact on sort of headline sentiment. And headline sentiment right now is not overly robust. If you look at some sentiment readings, whether it's on retail basis, you, know, you see the percent of investors that are you know uh, looking at a looking at the market under a bearish view, that's in the bottom decile over the past three years. Similarly, if you look at it, on, we have an institutional uh, confidence index that is it's below the level of 100, which indicates more sort of a risk off positioning. 
see this in fund flows, risk off positioning there. So I think what, what to expect in the second half is this continuation of a very complex market environment where you do have the you know multiple dimension of risks converging on one each other. And I think you know that's why in our our, our outlook we we titled it seeking clarity amid this complexity because you know, we are likely to in, continue to endure elevated levels of volatility, not only in stocks, but in other asset classes as well. And I think investors need to be aware of that when allocating capital. So let's talk about the market outlook for the second half and how investors can position their portfolios. Uh, so State Street uh, recommends three strategies. I saw in your note, uh, emphasize high quality value in the core, limit duration, uh, in pursuit of uh, real income and consider inflation sensitive alternatives. So let's start with high quality value in the core. Uh, tell us more about uh, why you expect high quality value companies uh, to do well in the second half. Yeah, I mean, I think what it comes down to is the trend that we've started to witness over the past few months. You know. Uh, Basically, when we partition the U.S. equity market by firms that are profitable relative to the ones that are non-profitable, and this is based on trailing 12 months earnings per share, so just the actual earnings, not the not the growth. So these are firms that are actually generating generating positive free cash flow, and we look at it as profitable firms have significantly outperformed unprofitable firms this year, and this. It actually holds even when you neutralize sector biases. Uh, the average you know, net spread differential um, is positive for every single sector when you take that profitable minus unprofitable. Similarly, when you break it up into quintiles, quintile one, so the most profitable firms, actually have positive performance this year, while the quintile five is basically down over 35%. So we like this idea of profitability and quality because we are definitely in this marketplace where you know the early part of the pandemic rally and into 2021, this has shifted as, as rates rose because the math changed for some of these high growth darlings. But we, we changed from a market that was driven by narratives, a narratively driven market of, you know, based on stock stories, promising these sort of grandiose proclamations of revolutionary growth. And at that time period, you know, people didn't really look at overall bottom line fundamentals. Now we are having this changeover of a, from a narratively, narratively driven market to one that is purely focused on fundamentals. And we think you know, owning these firms that have consistent growth, quality balance sheets that do not have a lot of debt, high return on equity, profitability, that could be a potential benefit as we enter this marketplace where sentiment has become more uneven, where you do have basically essentially the same amount of firms that are witnessing upgrades, while downgrades are seeing more negative forward guidance, more focus on the fundamentals. Investors should do the same and focus on firms that have consistent fundamentals, more durable balance sheets. But the only thing about that is, you know, when we add a second lens to the market performance, what we found is that the area that has had the strongest performance is not just profitable stocks, but inexpensive profitable stocks. So when we do that sort of Fama French style double sort, we create those six different portfolios based on inexpensive profitability versus neutral profitability and so on and so forth. We find is that profitable, inexpensive stocks are up this year, while profitable, expensive stocks are actually down about 15%. So we like this idea of combining high quality value in the core, allowing investors to focus on fundamentals, but do it at a more reasonable price. And you know, again, there's different ways to, to construct this. You can do multi-factor combination of it. You could look at you know dividend equities where dividend equities are close cousin to value. It's more of a value screen. But if the dividend exposure is also a, a growth, dividend growth, where you have firms continuously you know, growing their dividend for 20 consecutive years, that adds an element of quality to it as well. So some of the ETFs that are worth a look are uh, this one quality factor ETF. Uh, the ticker symbol is uh, QUS. 
And uh, for uh, dividend focus strategies, uh, this S&P dividend ETF, the ticker symbol is SDY, and this one which focuses on value, uh, and the it's the Spider Portfolio S&P 500 uh, value ETF, and the ticker symbol is SPYV. Uh, tell us a little bit about these ETFs. So the first one, QUS, that is that multi-factor blend. It blends both quality and value factors amid minimum, uh, min volatility. So to sort of give you this more balanced factor exposure within sort of a defensive core-oriented solution. The second one is S, you know, SDY. It's index. It seeks to track firms that have consistently upgraded their dividend for 20 consecutive years. And that's just the minimum because there are some stocks in there that have increased their dividend for over 50 consecutive years which, you know, 20 years in its own right, you've seen different business cycles and able to withstand economic and fundamental volatility as well as economic, you know, recessions and so on and so forth. Um, the last one, you know, is, is a pure value ETF, but the starting base is because of the S&P 500 methodology, every firm within that has to be profitable over the subsequent four or the, or the prior four quarters. So you do get this element of profitability, but also value. Very interesting. And now let's talk a little bit about um, fixed income. And uh, it has been a very challenging environment for bonds as well. In fact, uh, bonds had their first start uh, to the year in many, many decades. And many experts predicted that these, the decades-long bull market uh, in bonds has come to an end. But we have seen some uh, renewed interest in bonds lately. It seems that investors are going bargain hunting in these beaten down bonds. Uh, so so tell us what investors should do in their fixed income portfolios. Well, I mean, I think the, the biggest headwind is going to be duration because our, in our view, obviously the Federal Reserve is you know, going to continue to hike rates. You know, the, the implied rate uh, based on futures pricing right now is around 2.85 by the end of the year. And that's on the Fed funds rate. Typically, there's about a 34 basis point premium for the U.S. two-year relative to the Fed funds rate. So that puts the U.S. two-year above 3%. At the same time, you're going to have quantitative tightening with the Fed rolling off their balance sheet. We think that's likely to sort of you know, shift uh, the long bond, the 10-year higher. We don't think the curve is going to invert. We've actually, you know, and I think what we've seen since it had a sort of very, very, very brief inversion um, is, you know, it's been sort of range bound. And I think Part of the reason for that is that you know the U.S. two-year yield got a little bit ahead of itself because again all that forward guidance, you know, really pushed you know market rates the U.S. two-year, which is the most sensitive to monetary policy, higher initially. I think now it's it's hasn't moved as you know violently over the past few trading sessions. So it's you know we're going to see a little bit of a give back there. So we don't think that uh, a lot of um, uh, there's not going to be a lot of curve flattening. It's likely to be sort of range bound but moving, shifting higher along each tenor. So with higher rates, duration management is going to be significantly more important. So we think having a more lower duration bias is likely to be more beneficial than you know, extending duration. But in doing so, that's going to sort of con constrain your income generation potential. So we like this low duration, high income type of strategies, you know, mainly actively managed to you know, give you that sufficient yield capture, but in a way that is not uh, overextending on duration. Now let's talk about uh, inflation, uh, which has been, as we discussed, one of the biggest or the biggest concern for investors. And uh, as we discussed, there are some signs that inflation may have peaked, but it is expected to remain at elevated levels. And over the past few months, investors have been looking at assets that tend to do well in an inflationary environment. Uh, they have been adding commodity and real, uh, real asset exposure in their portfolios. Uh, do you think it is not too late, still not too late, to add more inflation hedges, more inflation sensitive assets in the portfolio. And uh, also please talk about which assets uh, do well in, in a high inflation environment according to state's rate research. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, while 
inflation may have peaked because we already, you know, we've already come down. The most recent print has been lower than the, the month prior. Um, so essentially, you know, you could say that inflation has peaked, but what has not peaked is sort of inflation uncertainty. You know, is it going to be higher or lower than the most recent print works? And uh, econ economists' expectations and how do they match that up? Uh, so we're still going to have inflationary uncertainty, and, and also inflation is still going to be elevated. And you know, we're, we're unlikely to get down to the two percent level until you know, probably back half 2023, if not start of 2024. And there's all these sort of inflationary tailwinds. You know, we mentioned earlier the Russia-Ukraine war, supply chains, uh, zero COVID policy in China, and things along those lines. So you know, this sort of focusing on inflation-sensitive alternatives can potentially be beneficial because also they do have a low correlation to traditional assets. Um, some of those areas are like tips and gold. You know, I think gold in terms of sort of defensive properties to uh, mitigating you know vo equity volatility can be helpful as well. When you look at its correlation to the global portfolio, it's only about a 0.2. Yet it has a beta sensitivity to inflation of around one. I think if you're looking for more inflation sensitivity, looking at natural resource equities could be helpful. It's going to not provide as much diver potential diversification, just given that it has a, you know, basically a 0.8 correlation to the global portfolio of stocks and bonds historically. But its inflation sensitivity is around three. So you're going to pick up some. Uh, additional inflation sensitivity by focusing on natural resource equities. I think one of the things about some of these segments of the market that are more inflation sensitive, like REITs, like natural resource equities, like TIPS, gold, and commodities, which is the most inflation sensitive, is that you know together or even standalone basis, they can be volatile. So we actually have a strategy that you know, looks at real assets in and of itself, and will rotate among those applying sort of a risk-aware you know, risk manage uh, portfolio management process to it. So we like that sort of actively managed real asset type sector portfolio that will have all of these different exposures, but will, you know, will also give a or pay attention to and uh, look at the you know volatility of, of these as well. So you're talking about uh, RLY, which is the mm -hmm. Spider SSGA multi-asset real uh, return ETF actively managed. Uh, and uh, there's another one which provides exposure to global uh, natural resources. The ticker symbol is GNR. And uh, both these have done really well this year. We know that all the inflation hedges, uh, natural resources, commodities, they have been out significantly outperforming the broader markets. Uh, both these are up more than 17% year to date. You mentioned gold as well. And uh, gold, uh, you know, gold has also outperformed uh, the stock, major stock indexes, but it is not up a lot this year. Uh, so do you think uh, gold is going to outperform, finally outperform and uh, deliver the kind of return it is expected to deliver in a high inflation and uh, environment with a lot of macroeconomic uncertainty? Well, I mean, I think with respect to gold, you know, it's the the sort of relationship to inflation sometimes tends to be a bit overstated. You know, as I mentioned earlier, it has a you know beta sensitivity to inflation around one, so it is you know it is far more sensitive to inflation uh, than you know your traditional sort of bond allocation, right? So global bonds, you know, basically a negative uh, sensitivity to inflation, as you would expect. Um, but you know, so. Natural resource equities have a much higher inflation sensitivity, right? And some of that goes down to the inputs and of how those firms generate profits and revenue. So for gold, inflation is just one of the things that could potentially be driving near-term performance. You know, if we look at what, some of the other macro factors, uh, real rates, real rates are you know a strong determinant of gold performance, and real rates have moved higher as the Federal Reserve has start to you know overall just raise rates, and that has put upward pressure on on the real rate uh, environment and market cycle. Also, the dollar, you know, the dollar has been significantly stronger this year, and that again is going to you know run counter to you know, gold's overall performance you know the dollar is you know basically up seven percent this year uh, and that's going to be a, a headwind for gold overall performance um so i think when we think about gold you know we look at it, it's up about you know two and a half percent as of today and you know that is a you know positive source of diversification because stocks and bonds are both down 
and you have now have an asset class that is up. But yet, when we look at its volatility profile, it is far less volatile than commodities, which again, commodities are 37%, but that's come with significantly higher volatility. So I think the role of gold in portfolios continues to be the sort of you know, uh, potential defensive risk mitigator that also has a positive relationship to inflation uh, that can continue to serve you know, investors potentially well as a strategic asset class in addition to you know, potentially tactically overweighting gold in an environment where there is surging inflation as well as elevated volatility. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Gold does deserve a place in the portfolio, mainly because of its low correlations with other uh, asset classes and also because of volatility, low volatility, as you mentioned. Now, switching gears a little bit, I also wanted to talk about uh, fund flows, uh, which I know you track very closely. And uh, ETFs uh, have gathered uh, more than $270 billion in assets uh, this year, uh, which is quite impressive uh, if even though this is considerably below last year's record base, um, breaking pace, uh, which is not surprising given the market performance. Uh, so tell us about uh, what you have seen lately from fund flow trends, uh, which areas are seeing more interest from investors? Yeah, so there's definitely been a defensive mindset within fund flow trends. So we've seen significant allocations to government bond ETFs, particularly on the ultra short side, where you know essentially you're taking very, very little um, equity risk due to the negative correlation to equities, but also very, very little rate risk given that you know, the duration of some of these is you know, 0.07 years because it's one to three month T bills. Um, so very defensive mindset from that perspective. And on the equity side, you know, sector flows have been very defensively oriented. If we look at the differential between defensive and cyclical sectors, on a rolling three-month basis, it is at the sort of, you know, largest differential of all time, favoring defensive uh, in, in lieu of cyclical. So you take those two factors combined, there has been more of a focus from investors to ha- to be a bit more defensive. And then secondarily, you know, we look at the percent of ETFs that have had inflows, you know, roughly only about uh, 52% of ETFs have had inflows uh, in the month of, in, or in last month on a year-to-date basis, it's roughly around 51%. Uh, the historical median is around 62, 63%. So there, while there's been softer inflows and those inflows have been defensive, there's also been a hesitancy to allocate capital. Uh, and I think that speaks to the volatility environment and just largely to overall sentiment that there's still a lot of hesitancy around this sort of very complex type of market structure. Very interesting trends. Uh, that's all we have time for today. Matt, thanks again for joining us. I always enjoy chatting with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the show so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.